Hello, welcome back. Today I've got a slightly different kind of video for you. Unless you've been living under a rock for the past few weeks, then you've probably seen a lot of chatter online about Terraform. And what I want to talk about today is the latest news that a group called OpenTF have actually forked Terraform. So let's take a moment and look at what's led up to this, what's actually happened, who are OpenTF, and what are the plans going forward for Terraform. So there's a fair amount to unpack here. To understand all this, let's rewind a little bit and go back to where this all started. On August 10th, the maintainers of Terraform, HashiCorp, released a statement announcing that they were going to be changing the licensing on all of their core products, including Terraform, from the open source Mozilla Public License, or MPL, to what's known as a business source license. This naturally caused quite a lot of reaction, especially in the open source community, mostly because this business source license, or BSL, is not a true open source license. So before we go much further, let's have a quick look at the license itself and see how it differs from the original Mozilla public license and how it potentially affects Terraform going forward. So at first glance, the new BSL license appears, at least for non-commercial use, to be very similar to its open source equivalent. People are still free to copy, modify and redistribute the Terraform source code. Where things get a little murkier, however, is for commercial use. Commercial use under the new license is subject to this additional use grant. And this is where we get a clear understanding about the intent and motives behind this decision to change the license. And if we look at the additional use grant, we can see that commercial use is allowed, but provided it's not used in a way that's competitive with HashiCorp's products. And this is clear if we go and have a look at the announcement that HashiCorp actually made on August 10th. We can see that commercial use is allowed, except we're providing a competitive offering to HashiCorp. And down below this is clarified as vendors who provide competitive services built on our community products will no longer be able to incorporate future releases, bug fixes, or security patches contributed to our products. So what does that mean exactly, and who exactly does this license change affect? At first glance that might be simple, but it's not too clear what actually defines a competitive offering to HashiCorp. If we look at the actual text in the license, we can see that HashiCorp tries to define this as running Terraform on a hosted or embedded basis, which is competitive with HashiCorp's products. Again, the use of the words hosted or embedded is a little bit subjective. It's not very clear exactly what that means. And the nature of being competitive with HashiCorp isn't clearly defined. We can delve a bit further into the licensing FAQ that HashiCorp released alongside the initial announcement and have been updating ever since. We can see vague attempts to define what is competitive and what is not. The FAQ goes into some fairly lengthy scenarios, including cross-competition across different products. For example, if you are building a product that's competitive with Vault, it would be okay to use Terraform to deploy the infrastructure for that product. Or if you have a product that competes with Terraform, but you use Vault behind the scenes, then that's not in violation of their new license agreement. But if you use Vault to compete with Vault or Terraform to compete with Terraform, then you are or potentially are in violation of their new license. So the situation we find ourselves in at the moment is that we've got a license that is fairly vaguely worded and raises more questions than it answers, and an ever-expanding FAQ to try and deal with those uncertainties. But for many people, this gets to the heart of the issue, the reason why they're uncomfortable with this license change from a traditional open source model to this business source license. Under a license such as the Mozilla Public License, it's 100% clear exactly what we can and can't do with the source code and with the product. And having that fundamental clarity, especially for a tool that underpins the infrastructures of thousands of organizations worldwide, is really important. Under the new license, there are so many scenarios which leave it unclear as to whether your usage of Terraform would be in violation of the new license. Are you a competitor of Terraform? And it appears the only way to be truly sure of that is to ask HashiCorp. So now we've got a situation where the licensing nuances of a tool that's used by thousands of organizations worldwide and depended on is really just at the whim of one company and whether they determine that you are in competition with them or not. Another key point as well is that due to having a CLA and owning the rights to all of the code, HashiCorp were able to make this license change, and there's nothing stopping them from making future modifications or license changes in the future. So what happens potentially in the future if HashiCorp identifies something else apart from direct competition that also affects their bottom line? Are they going to pull the rug from under the license once again? These are all valid questions that are being asked, and many people feel that having this level of uncertainty around Terraform threatens its very future as the de facto standard for infrastructure configuration. So it's clear that the license change is for commercial reasons, it's to protect HashiCorp. Most people wouldn't argue that the role of a company is to serve its shareholders and to protect its commercial interests and to protect its bottom line. That's what HashiCorp are trying to do here, and as a commercial company, I don't think that's an unreasonable thing for them to undertake. But many feel now that we're at a bit of a crossroads between a commercial entity that have been the custodians of Terraform up until now 
and the open source community at large that adopts Terraform, that uses it, that innovates on top of it. And I think one thing this license change has done is amplify the misalignment between HashiCorp's interests as a commercial entity and the open source community at large that have adopted and advocated for Terraform over the past nine years and helped it grow to become the number one infrastructure as code tool that exists today. Having one commercial entity who can decide who can and can't use Terraform in a commercial setting is damaging to the community at large. Having competition around this commercial space enables innovation, competition, and ultimately benefits the users by giving them more choice. We only have to look at the Git ecosystem with GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket. Competition encourages innovation, and ultimately we have a plethora of brilliant tools to choose from. That choice can only benefit users and can only benefit the community as a whole. So without focusing too much on what HashiCorp have done and whether they were ethically right to do what they did or not, one thing that's clear to a lot of us is that the only way forward for Terraform is to stay a truly free open source tool, to be guided by the community and to serve the community. Because without being an open source tool in the first place, then it's very doubtful that Terraform would have grown to be the number one tool in its space that it is today. So since HashiCorp's announcement on August 10th, there was a flurry of activity on the internet, lots of opinions, lots of discussions, lots of speculation. And while there are some camps that are understanding and even supportive of HashiCorp's stance on this, it came clear that there's an overwhelming number of people that support our views, that see the only way forward is to keep Terraform open source. So while all that was playing out on the internet, a lot of the key players and individuals in the sort of Terraform space started to come together to try and understand the impact that these changes have on Terraform and the community at large and how to come up with a plan of action to respond. This quickly led to a coalition of companies that all banded together and formed a group called OpenTF. And on August 15th, just five days after HashiCorp's initial announcement, OpenTF released its manifesto. The manifesto at the time was backed by several key companies in the Terraform ecosystem, pledging resources, services, and funding for full-time engineers in order to ensure the stability and future of Terraform. Since then, those numbers have exploded. At the time of recording, we're looking at over 100 different companies and 400 individuals, all pledging their resources and their time to aid the initiative. The manifesto that OpenTF published laid out two steps. The first step was to appeal to HashiCorp to reverse their decision and to revert Terraform back to a true open source license and to put guardrails in place that it stays that way forever. The initial aim of OpenTF wasn't an eject reaction to rush off and create a fork. Its first attempt was to get HashiCorp to reconsider its decision and change the licensing on Terraform back to open source and everyone can move on. But we also understood the ramifications if that didn't happen and the need to protect the future of Terraform as an open source tool. Therefore, the second step laid out in the manifesto made it clear that if HashiCorp didn't agree to reverse the licensing terms on Terraform, then it would be prepared to fork Terraform as a project. So the intent of the OpenTF initiative was really clear from day one. Its primary objective and sole reason for being was simply to protect the future of Terraform and to ensure that it stays an open source tool even if that means forking it. On August 18th, OpenTF once again publicly appealed to HashiCorp to engage with the community. Behind the scenes over the next few days, work carried on on what most people saw as the inevitable outcome. And as we approached August 25th, there had been no response from HashiCorp. On August 25th, after still no response from HashiCorp, OpenTF announced that they had forked the Terraform project. So the announcement on August 25th made it clear that OpenTF have moved to their second step of their manifesto. They have forked the Terraform project. There's already been a substantial amount of work doing a repository-wide rename to get ready for the first release. There's been a lot of effort put into community documentation. And OpenTF have already implemented CICD and testing frameworks to ensure that the new fork remains backwardsly compatible from day one. So now we know that Terraform has been forked, what do we know about what's coming next and what the future holds for Terraform? So first of all, it's always been OpenTF's publicly stated intent that if it was to fork Terraform, then that fork should be donated to a reputable foundation. One of the key things that makes a project fork successful or not is adoption. And adoption is built on trust. And a lot of people feel that trust has been lost with the recent licensing changes by HashiCorp. And simply having another bunch of companies with their own commercial interests running Terraform wouldn't do a lot to reinstate that trust. And the only way it can regain the trust of the users in the community is to ensure that the governance is impartial and independent, and that can only really be achieved by donating the projects to a foundation. 
As of recording this video, the OpenTF initiative have completed all of the initial paperwork in order to submit the project to the Linux Foundation, and the stated end goal is to have it accepted into the CNCF. That will provide a strong home for Terraform, and with all the commitments of the companies that started OpenTF for resources, for funding, for services, coupled with the impartial governance that the CNCF can provide, we think this is the best and most positive outcome for Terraform. This will ensure that it stays open source, stays in the community, and the future roadmap of this tool that started out as Terraform will live on to serve the benefits of its users and the community and not be at the behest of the business interests of a commercial entity. Though it's certainly been a pretty busy week in the Terraform world, if you blinked you might have missed it. Before I sign off I just want to answer some of the more common questions that have come up since the fork got announced last week. Firstly, let's talk about timescales. So the project's been forked, but is not publicly accessible yet. There's a lot of work going on behind the scenes to ensure that the source code in the fork of Terraform is release ready. And OpenTF have released a public roadmap that lists out the next steps that need to be completed before the repository is made public. And we're all hoping that that work gets completed and the repository gets made public in the next one to two weeks. Another common question is, is OpenTF a drop-in replacement for Terraform? The short answer is yes, the Terraform project has been forked from version 1.5.5. The first release will be fully compatible with that, and one of OpenTF's stated aims is to make sure that the OpenTF project remains backwardsly compatible. Another question around providers and modules. If you switch to OpenTF, will you still be able to use the legacy Terraform ones? The answer is yes. There's a lot of emphasis on making sure that legacy providers and modules work with the new OpenTF fork, and that will be a number one priority going forward with new releases too. One of the biggest questions is, will the future releases of OpenTF continue to be compatible with legacy Terraform? The short answer to that is yes for now. OpenTF's initial intent is to make the migration from Terraform to OpenTS as seamless as possible and to maintain that compatibility. But since OpenTF is a community-driven project, then in the future, if the community decides to go a different direction, then that's the direction that OpenTF will take. But for right now, there are no plans for any feature deviation, and the priority right now is to make sure that OpenTF remains compatible with Terraform. The last question is, will OpenTF have enough resources dedicated to the project to ensure that it can be maintained in an effective way? As I said earlier, we've had 100 plus companies dedicate resources and services to the project. A handful of those companies have also pledged a significant amount of funding for full-time engineers. At the time of recording, we've got pledges for up to 14 full-time engineers for quite a number of years to come. That, combined with the hundreds of community members that have pledged their time and their resources to aid the project, I think gives OpenTF a really bright future. If you want to know more and keep updated with what's happening with OpenTF, or if you want to get involved and help yourself, then I'll leave links down in the description to all the relevant sites. If you want to get directly involved in the project, you can pledge some resources or other help by signing the manifesto, which is still open. If you'd just like to show your support to the OpenTF initiative and what it stands for, then like this video, leave a comment below, and share it out on social media and help us spread the word. My name's Craig Dunn. I'm a developer advocate over at Spacelift. Spacelift was one of the first pledges to the OpenTF initiative. We believe its future is bright, and we are really proud to be a part of it. I hope you've enjoyed this video. We will be coming out with some more updates on OpenTF in the very near future, so please subscribe to the channel so you don't miss those. Comment below with any questions, and see you in the next one.